Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Well, here we are another week uh, with Wounded for War. We are uh, diving in right where we left off in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. And as a recap, I just want to re- remind us that um, Paul so far has been dealing with issues in the, in the church at Corinth. And uh, he started with the divisiveness that was in the church. Have you ever uh, found yourself in a place where you just kind of wonder uh, whether you're really in uh, in the kingdom of God or whether you're not, whether God loves you or whether um, you're kind of on the outs? Have you ever wondered, um, you know, based on my relationship with the church, how does that work out? And, and if I'm not connected to a church, does that mean that I'm not connected to God? Um, some of these things I think we're going to find out in the scripture that we actually read today. But because Paul has set a foundation for us, and that foundation is that there's this problem of uh, disjointedness among God's people. There's this, um, hey, you follow that guy, I follow this guy, and so all of a sudden, I'm better than you or you're better than me. And there's this there's a, like a rivalry within the church. And so Paul has spent a long time so far talking in, to the church about unity. Now, is there ever an area to draw a line in the sand and divide? Yes. And Paul makes it clear here. This is where uh, there's one, uh, one, one way to look at things, if you will. Black and white. You're in or you're out. Based on what he's about to share with us. And so he wants... The, the people in Corinth to lay aside their differences, the petty garbage that they're, they're arguing about, whether one leader is better than the other. Um, Paul clearly stated, hey, they're all just servants. Every one of us are just servants. We're not supposed to be uh, elevating any other one man over the other. So what does that leave us with? It leaves us in a, in a, in a moment where we have to ask, then what, what is it that we gather around? What do we unify over? And what defines someone being in uh, Christ and not? Maybe maybe you've um, been uh, a part of the church before and you've walked away. Or maybe you've never been a part of a church and you just have this feeling that I have a personal kind of um, relationship with God. And it's an inner work that you just kind of, you feel like because you talk to uh, something up there that, uh, that you're good. And, and, and most people that would kind of contemplate that f- form of thought, they would also lean on kind of uh, an ideology that says, hey, I do more good than bad. I try to listen to that conscience and, and, and do the right thing. But does any of that matter? Let's read what he has to say, and I'm just going to go through it. Today is a little bit different in the sense that um, I usually have a lot of comments to go along with, but, you know, as I just started reading through this, Scripture just started popping left and right to explain itself. So, we're going to read a lot of Scripture today, um, but I think you're going to find that it clarifies everything we need clarified for us. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So, Paul immediately makes a distinction here that there's only one foundation that we build our faith on, and that's Jesus Christ himself. 
no other foundation. And, and Paul laid that foundation in the church of Corinth. But then, as mentioned before, some people came in. They started teaching, uh, you know, that, that, hey, this teacher, Apollos or, or Cephas or Peter or Paul, you know, who's greater? Actually, we're all just servants. The greater thing is actually uh, there's only one, and that's Jesus. They started to uh, rally around people. We today rally around doctrines. We rally around uh, denomination um, differences, right? Is it any different, really? Not really. Paul would say that there are the main core issues, and that's Jesus and what we believe about it. You see, every other foundation uh, for, for religion is you work to get to God. But you see, Christianity is so different in that God did the work to get to you. How do we know this? You know, Paul, Paul's pretty clear that Jesus is the foundation. But there was a story where this, this uh, religious dude uh, wanted to know how to be saved. He wanted to know, how can I be uh, saved or born again? Maybe you've heard that term. Christianity uh, is well known for it in the past, is, is to be born again, right? I've heard people say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I'm not, I'm not one of those born-againers or something of that nature, right? But really, what does it mean to be born again? Why is that important? Why is that a part of Christianity? Well, in John 3, 5 and 6, Jesus himself lays out what that means. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we know that we are uh, born of water, and he's talking about uh, a natural birth from your mother. Uh, you come out and to the world, and you are flesh, right? But then he says there's another dynamic. There's a second birth. There's a birth of the spirit. That literally, we are dead in our spirit. Somehow, we can that can come alive. And how does that come alive? It's through a, a new birth within your spirit. That he literally says he would plant his Holy Spirit within you. That you are just flesh and bone and, and you're just going about in your own life, doing your own thing until he enters in, you accept that gift that he offers for salvation and not just salvation, but for a new life. We're going to see that as we go along. And that new life, you need a new nature, a new spirit. And so he gives that to us. You know, that's what we're supposed to build on is the foundation in which God gives to you, not in which man tries to conjure up. So my efforts, my works, my plans, they don't amount to anything. But God's work, God's plans, God's effort always completely uh, gets everything done and accomplished the way he desires. So in verse 12, he says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will be obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. So, we have this foundation. It's Jesus Christ. But then Paul goes on and it says, but we're going to build on it, right? There's going to be people that come along and build on it. And essentially, what he's leaning towards here is, is he's saying, hey, you know, Apollos and, and Paul and Cephas, these are leaders in the church. These guys planted, some watered. So he's saying, hey, that there's going to be leaders that are supposed to be planting and watering seeds and, and helping you grow. He literally said that you're God's building, God's field in the last verse, in, in verse 9. And so he, he's using these references that, that you're like a field or you're like a building that, that's being built. And we're doing that work. We're supposed to be laboring to, to uh, bring maturity in one's life. So they build on that foundation of Christ, right? But he gives a warning and he says, hey, don't build with garbage. Build with 
good resources. Why? Because he says it's going to be tested by fire at some point. Now, literally, all of it's going to be tested by fire. Now, you know and I know that fire is going to consume wood, it's going to consume hay, and it's going to consume the straw. It's going to be burnt up, toast. only thing that's going to be left, ashes, right? However, he says, but you could build with other resources. How about gold, silver, and uh, costly stones? You know, at some point, whatever you do in your faith, it's going to be uh, tested. It's going to be tested by fire, and it's going to become obvious what uh, you built with, which resources. Interestingly enough, this is designed to help us understand that leaders have a heavy responsibility to be building with proper uh, materials. Now, what do I mean by materials? You know, today we build uh, what we consider the church building, and and then we bring people in as uh, people that we're going to teach. But really, when we think about a church, church, we're thinking about building, we're thinking about facilities, we're thinking about uh, parking, we're thinking about structure, we're thinking about those things. And that is not what he's referencing. He is referencing that that there's a, a, a building up of the body of Christ. Jesus is referencing us as the church. We. Why does he say that? Because we're the ones that are going out and accomplishing God's work and will. We're the ones that are going to be redeemed one day to him, not a building. He's pouring into us. Leaders are supposed to represent him and pour into us as well, right? Into you, into me. And so we need to heed his warning when it says that we got to be careful about what we build with. I'm not talking about wood, hay, and stubble, um, you know, structural product. We're talking about the things that we add into our life. So we've had this foundation, right? Jesus Christ, I accept him into my life. He's now my savior. But is he my Lord? You see, lordship means that now I have a relationship. The Holy Spirit's been implanted into me, and now I have this new consciousness. I'm, I'm alive through my spirit and his spirit dwelling in me. And, and now, now the building uh, materials, if you will, are going to build character, nature, um, to be Christ-like. You know, it, it's probably best... Uh, said this way in second corinthians chapter 5 verse 5 it says now he who prepared us for this very purpose is god who gave to us the spirit as a pledge what does that mean he literally imparted his holy spirit into you to pledge and what's a pledge it's it's to remind you hey i i gave you earnest money right for a house what does that mean I'm, i'm i'm definitely coming back for that house I've already put money down on it. He put one of his most uh, precious resources, his spirit. And he put it as a deposit in you and I to remind us that we're his and that he's coming back one day. Now, it also goes on in 2 Corinthians a little bit further in um, Verses 17 through 19 on chapter 5, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so if you and I consider ourselves saved and, and, and part of Jesus, he's a new creation, a new creature. So he or she, you and I, God sees us as a new creation. So you might say, well, what's the point of changing then? Because he sees me the way I'm perfect, Right? The old things have passed away, it says. Behold, new things have come. The journey or the process is figuring out how to let go of the old and how to take on the new, right? It's not natural to me. And so I have this old nature and I have this new nature. And, and, and he's saying the old things have passed away and you have a new, you are a new creation, but you need to learn to walk in it. 
Now these things are from God, he says in verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So not only did he save you, he saved you for something. He actually wants to utilize you. He wants to give you a purpose. You're going to become a minister of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Stop right there. That's, that's so worthy of just pausing. He just said that God is reconciling people to himself. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to chase God down. You don't have to try and climb up a ladder. You don't have to do all this work of religious activity. He said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Man, I got a lot of trespasses. How about you? He's not counting them against us. Isn't that great? Why? And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as Though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled. He made him who knew, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So he literally took our sin. He didn't, he, he who knew no sin took on my sin so that I can gain his righteousness. It would be accounted to me. He's given us this new nature, this new life. He's given us his righteousness. He's not counting my sin against me anymore. And he's given me a ministry of reconciliation. You know, in uh, Romans 5, 18 and 19, it says, So then, as through one's transgression there resulted com condemnation to all men. Who is he talking about? That, that speaks to not only the fact that you and I have a sinful nature and we sin every day. And, and we look at our old life and we go, you know, I, I get it. I, I did a lot of things and I, and I built patterns in my life. And, and so now I got to, you know, get rid of those old nature and get rid of that old life. And he's actually appealing to a much deeper, much further back uh, lineage of sin that was given to you and I. And that's Adam, the very first uh, human. That he sinned through one transgression that resulted condemnation to all men. But the, the beauty is what comes after. Even so, through one act of righteousness, which is what we just talked about, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, there resulted justification and life to all men. So you could be justified before God, just as if I didn't sin, is how I like to remind myself uh, what that means. And, and not only that, that He gives you a new life. For as though the one man's disobedience, for through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. A lot of people don't like that term, sinners. But you see, through one man, not even you didn't even have to do anything. The fact that Adam sinned made you a sinner, made us all by nature sinners. Even so, through the obedience of one man, the many were made righteous. That's his work. That's God's work. That's Jesus' work. Notice in the earlier uh, scripture that I gave, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 19, it was, it was very much his work. It said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. And then it says, who reconciled us to himself, that's God doing the work, that Christ was, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, that's his work, all this has to do with him. It's on his work, his foundation. That's why he said to die when he was up on the cross. It is finished. Why? Because everything that was required from the law for you to be righteous was accomplished in that moment. You know, 
that that should clarify enough that there's a foundation for our salvation. That's Jesus. But then beyond that, it's a work of the Holy Spirit in your life. He's he's changing us. He's moving in us. He's he's doing a, a big work in us. And it's so that we can live that new life, be that new creation. You know, he gives a warning towards the end about if anyone builds with a flesh uh, or, or works or things that are not what God had intended, then it's not going to go well. As a matter of fact, he says in verse 14, if anyone works, sorry, if anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved. But only as through fire. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. You know, in this section, it sounds like it's all back on you, right? Your work. If anyone's work, uh, if it's if it survives, then great, you're going to be rewarded. If, if your work doesn't survive, then, well, at least you'll be saved. But, but what he's talking about here is you're partnering with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you. So, this new spirit's been imparted to us. We now have him dwelling in us. We've been saved, but lordship comes through submission of your will to his will. And that's where we spend time intimately in prayer and seeking the Lord through that time. And it's not a, a cold, callous relationship where I'm just reading the scripture and there's the truth and, and then, well, I just follow it. So set of rules and I just try and do everything I can. That, that's not what he's talking about here. That's religion. And he spoke against religion. As a matter of fact, what he's talking about is as he dwells in you and his spirit's in you and he starts to speak to you about things, you submit. You become more and more of that new creation, more and more Christ-like. Now you could reject it. And you could try your own way. Because it's relationships, let's face it, they're messy, right? And how about, you know, if you had a perfect individual and then an imperfect individual? It's just kind of even more messier, right? I mean, my wife's pretty perfect and I am the opposite. And the reality is we clash all the time. Now, in this case, though, if we're allowing him to work through us, we're going to notice that, that God, through his spirit, is working in our lives and working out things and working in things, right? And we can, we can say yes to him or we can say no to them. Maybe specifically like God's been putting on your heart, man, I, I got to stop drinking, as a functional savior, literally, I turn to that every time. Or I turn to, you know, uh, Netflix for comfort, or I turn to whatever your thing is that he keeps putting on your heart, it, that it's, it's not, it's not helpful to your walk. It's not beneficial to this new nature that the spirit's saying, let it go. You see, we see it as loss. God sees it as gain. And that one day, There'll be a loss. And that loss is, is because we, we decided not to listen to the Holy Spirit. We decided to do our own thing. Well, we're going to build our own uh, way. It says you're going to experience loss in that case. You can either lose it now by choice or lose it then. You know, one of the interesting things in this set of scriptures in verse 16, he says, don't you yourself know that you're God's temple? And then he says, for God's temple is holy. Earlier, he referred to us as a field. He referred to us as a building. And now he's referring to us as a temple. That word temple, however, is not just the place that, like, 
you know, Solomon built or, or Herod built. Or, these are temples that men built, right? He's not referring to that. What he's saying is actually the inner court. This word literally meant like the inner courtroom where, where literally the holy holies, right? The holy of holies where, where God's presence dwelled. And he's saying, man, God and his spirit live right inside of you. And you have a choice to listen and obey and be blessed for it. But he also says, if anyone destroys God's temple, if you decide that, that you're going to kick him out and you're going to live on your own merit and you're going to do your own thing, he says that God will destroy that person. Now keep in mind, he's talking to leaders. He's also talking to the church. And he's saying, whether it be leaders that you allow to lead you astray. You know, it does say in the end times that there will be many who, who take um, and store up these kind of leaders that just tickle their ear. That, In other words, tell them what they want to hear. They don't tell them the hard truths about God. That, that there's going to be a lot of that going on in the end times. And I see it without question. There's a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers, a lot of church movements, a lot of things that are not about. Jesus, the foundation, they're about political views, they're about um, their own agendas, they're about even popularity contests, they're about programs, they're about, you know, the, the lights, the show, the screens, you know, if we can put on a big production then everyone will come. That is not God's heart. He ought to be attractive just because he dwells in you and in me. Literally, as we walk through the streets, people ought to want to know what's different about that individual. And we can proclaim, God has changed me. I have a new nature. I'm a new creation. I'm no longer that guy you once knew. I've been uh, watching this guy that I early on in the ministry, uh, I interacted a lot with him and he was on edge and, and a lot had happened in his life and it was pretty devastating and now I've been watching him. It's like a year, year and a half later. And, and it's really cool because he just got his teeth fixed, right? And not only did he get his teeth fixed, but I see him doing these selfies. And, and he's just excited about what God's doing. He's opening doors and changing who he is and how he looks and, and just making a better life for himself. He's really enjoying the Spirit of God working on his behalf. And he's seeing the fruit about it. How about you? How about me? Are we submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to work in us? To become more like Christ. Remember, it's what we're using to build. Are you choosing to use resources that are wood, hay, and stubble and going to be burnt up one day? Are you using precious stones, gold, and silver? It's costly materials, aren't they? In other words, it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to let go of some things maybe that have brought comfort throughout your life, but it's to gain a greater comfort. Maybe it's uh, something that will you've always uh, trusted in to bring some peace, but there never seems to be peace long enough. You know, uh, the Lord goes on and he says, uh, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace, unmerited favor, unearned, in which we stand and we exalt in hope in the glory of God. Notice, we have peace with God through Jesus. Do you want peace today? I mean, real peace that lasts. Even during adversities and things like that, it comes through being connected by the Holy Spirit, growing in your walk, and on a foundation 
of what Jesus has done for you and for I. <clears throat> I want to pray for us. I want to uh, give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord. If he's been pricking your heart during this message and you've decided, you know what, I'm tired of trying to build my life my way or I'm trying to, well, I, I thought I was saved, but I don't have a relationship where he's my Lord. He said that if you confess me among men, then I'll, I would confess you among my father or to my father as mine. Like when, when you go to the gates of heaven, he's literally going to say, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. And that seems like, well, I did. Okay. I did a, a good job. No, he's just saying, Hey, you trusted in me. Come on in. The rest of it, the, sal the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, that has to do with the quality of your life here on earth how effective you are, uh, the life that you live, the legacy you leave, the people you impact. I want to pray. I want to ask that God would give you a desire to actually allow His Holy Spirit to work in you, to start to transform your life. You see, the gospel is... It's not about works, not about your works at least. It's about what he's done. It's not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning righteousness. It's not opposed to effort in the sense that we will work hard at letting go of things and work hard at saying, Lord, please help me with this new life. It is work, but you're not earning it. You're just leaning in to what he's already telling you. You already are. You are a new creation in Christ. If that's you, if that's your desire, if you want that, I want you to pray. And just make this your own prayer. Jesus, I thank you for what you've done on the cross. I thank you that you took my sin my unrighteous life and you buried it with you when you went in to the ground and Lord the new life that you did give me through you being raised and Lord you uh, you gave me your righteousness thank you for that Lord I know that I need you for this new life that you've given me. I know that I need your Holy Spirit and I pray that you would give me your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that Lord, you would have your way in us, that we would make you Lord, not just Savior. That we would walk with you as Adam did before he sinned in the cool of the morning, Lord, that we would seek your face and we would spend time intimately with you, asking in your word to teach us and to grow us by your spirit, by your word. Lord, I pray for those that would be listening, that have made that decision today, Lord, I pray that you would anoint them with your heart, your love, and your eyes that you would make them um, ambassadors for Christ, richly blessed with your presence. Lord, I pray that you would give them ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, that they would abide in you, that they would trust in you, that they would rest in you. I praise you for each one of those people that will hear this and respond. Pray that you would get them into a local body of believers, Lord, that, that they would be uh, able to grow and learn and bring in those good resources, Lord, that help us to become that new creation you've called us to be. Thank you. I praise you for your work. And I thank you that you allow us to partner with you in this transformation that you give to your children. Thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, by your authority, Lord. Amen. If you just prayed that, uh, you can leave a comment. 
you can uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and instant message me. Let me know that you made a decision for Christ. I'd love to pray for you and, uh, and actually get other people praying for you as well, that God would continue that road of growth for you. Until next week, see you and I love you guys.